Yes, sir. <laughs> Hassan, Hassan. Yes, sir. <laughs> What's up, bro? What's good, bro? Damn, you got your name behind you, too, just so people don't forget. Hey, man, my homeboy, he went to CVS and picked up some Sharpies. <laughs> so, and I picked up some Crayolas. So he did this sign with the Sharpie, and I did this with the Crayola. And, oh, wow. you know. It's, it's, two, different, it's two different signatures? <laughs> hey, he, he, he gave it to me as a present. And I was like, you know, I appreciate it. And so I'll put it up because, you know. And so, Justin, you're having a baby shower, right? That's the baby shower. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the only problem is the baby's not mine. <laughs> um, man, we here with say how you Hudson Hudson. I uh, cannot. Yeah, you got it. You got. You. I got you. Yeah. We here with Hassan. I gotta say it the American Negro way. Yeah, we here with Hassan Minaj, man. Urban Legends podcast. I want you to know, bro. The reason I created this uh, podcast, I, I had one to do it for like two years, and I didn't have time to do it until the the COVID shit happened. And yeah. the reason I started it because I wanted to celebrate people that I consider are living legends and people making legendary moves in their career. And, you know, we go back, like. Bro, <laughs> bro, come on now. Open it's mic days. Decade. decade, over a decade. Over a decade, bro. Yeah, man. And so, you know, we came up together, man. And I remember like doing open mics with you and everything like that. So I kind of want to get into your, you know, your background and everything like that and your story. Um, you know, I know, I know some things, but I don't know a lot of things post the celebrity, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's what I want to kind of dive into also, but, but I thought it was interesting. So you grew up in what, Northern California? I grew up in Northern California. Yeah. You know, what's yeah. so crazy, bros. Whenever you say that stuff, you're just like, oh, the celebrity stuff. It's like, you don't, you don't think about it, bro. Like, I remember when you were doing 21 Jump Street, I'm like, bro, he's in a major motion picture. Like, yo, Justin's a celebrity, you know, or when you were doing Rush Hour, I was like, yo, he's on the CBS lot. He's number one on the call sheet. Justin is a celebrity. But in your mind, you're just like, you're, you're the prot protagonist in your own little video game. So you're like, nah, this is all just kind of part of, you know what I mean? And you got kids at home. You're just, you're just playing out this little video game as your avatar. You don't realize your avatar, the perception of your avatar is changing with other people. So up. Me, like when I, like whenever you're just like oh you blow up on me I'm like bro you know me from diversity showcase like, what are you talking about <laughs> this is not a real I mean, but maybe that's the thing like with other with some of your other friends I don't know I'm like but that's just not a real thing to me but um but yeah man uh, hold on before up. you before you get into that before you get into that yes yeah. and I want to ask you that I mean I'm gonna get back to the other stuff but I have seen some people switch up um, I, I I've seen I've seen some people switch up some people that I've known from the open mic days when they oh, get a TV wow. show, when they get something, oh, okay. they harder to access and they hard, they start being more distant. And I'm the type of person where I'm like, yo, I'm already working. Like I've been working. Uh -huh. <laughs> I've been on TV, yeah. might've been on TV before you. And, and if you are getting it and you that hot dude right now, that's cool. But don't think I'm not going to also like, I'm not one thing away from right. Justin being out of here. Right, 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 right. So have you ever experienced that, though? You haven't experienced that in, the, in your career yet? Uh, man, I'll be, I, I got a little bit more of a measured approach. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, uh, uh, guards and shields that people put up. But the thing that, that, that I don't, um, that, that I think you also got to recognize, too, is you don't know what another person's going through. For a lot of people, everybody sees the Deadline article, everybody sees the Variety article, man, you don't know what that person's going through in their marriage, with their kids, they might have a divorce settlement, they might, have, you know, there's a million things, they might got a family member that's sick, there's a million things that, um, that you know, lights, camera, action, and the gram and the algorithm doesn't show you. I had sent him a text, I had sent him a text the other, that's his uh, manager <laughs> telling him to please get off this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> His publicist is like, no, please. Get, oh. us. <laughs> Get out of this. <laughs> Get out of this. It's no, going too deep too fast. No, funny enough, bro. That's 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 why I I gotta I gotta set this to uh, do not disturb. How do I do that? Let me do that. Do not Shout out to YP. We were just having that conversation about relationships, me and my uh my homeboy about relationships, the people that contact each other all throughout the day. And uh I'm not yeah. like that with my wife. Like we just talk right. at the end and I'm so, I like that. I like that we only talk at the end of the day. But I said, I think most relationships, the husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, they talk all throughout the day. Um, how do you like that, Hassan? <laughs> I, don't, 
I don't I like it as I'm as I'm messaging. I'm like, yo, I'm on a Zoom with the homie. Blue. Let me call you in 45 minutes. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> it's, it's interesting, bro. I got I got I got I mean, how many do you got? You got two or one? I just got one, and she's eight now. Yes. Oh, bro. Yeah. You like you grew up fast. I got a three year old and a, a one year old. So we got a newborn. So we're at, we're we're in that age where like any call could be anything. You know what I'm saying? Right so that might be on set, and it might be a text like, "Yo, I need we need to talk." And it's one of those things. I'm like, all right, I got to figure out what's what's happening on the ground. Like, like, like I all civilians alive. Like that's the sort of like thing that I got to check in on. You know what I mean? Yeah. No. Nah, no. Nah, straight up. I I feel you on that. Um. So yeah, man. Let, let I want to get into the backstory. So I thought it was very interesting. I listened to your your episode with uh Kevin Hart, which was a great great episode that y'all did on his podcast, uh, Comedy Gold Mines. Uh, great, great, great one. And I thought it was interesting because I didn't know you was on the debate team and I didn't know you, I think you talked about how when you saw Chris Rock for the first time, you thought that he was doing like comical debate or something. Or I was like, bro, he's just doing funny speech and debate. <laughs> That's it. Everyone was like, He's the greatest comedian of all time. I'm like, bro, he's on the forensics team. He's just being funny. He's just, he's just like a, doing funny forensics. Um, it's, it's, yeah, and so how did that then lead to you calling the comedy club? Because I, 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 I want people to hear the backstory before we go into, like, the future. Yeah, so, um, you know, we're, we're roughly the same age, right? So We are. I didn't know that either, but we are. <laughs> we're 80s, 90s kids, right? So we grew up in that era. And a, a lot of our, like, the seminal comedy that, like, shaped – our generation, whether it was like Def Jam, The Simpsons, um, South Park, all like Family Guy, all that sort of stuff. Um, all those Comedy Central Presents specials, uh, BET Comic View. We didn't have cable in the house. Like, like my mom was super strict with us. She let me do other things, but she she thought like cable would rot my mind. Like the same way parents think about social media. She's like, any kid with cable is not going to get good grades. They're going to be up all night watching crazy stuff on, on cable television. So I missed that whole era. I didn't see like all those seminal comedy specials, right? And I, I, I missed Chappelle show. Like I was, I was a senior in high school. I was becoming a freshman. And then when I decided to do comedy, when everybody was illegally downloading stuff in college my freshman year um i googled how to be a comedian the local comedy club had this comedian performing there um google told me if you want to be a comedian you call your local comedy club ask them to perform so i called i said hey i noticed dave chapley's performing can i open for dave chapley and like and and, and like they hung up on me and i called back and i'm like excuse me i would like that i would like to open for dave chapley you know and they kept thinking I was fucking with them. And I eventually went down to the club and they were like, yo, are you the Dave Chapley kid? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, his name's Dave Chappelle. And I didn't know all this stuff. So I ended up kind of having to um, download all that stuff. I put it in my brain and I, I was able to contextualize it. Like, oh, this is what sketch comedy is. And this is what this is. And what's kind of cool about that, I didn't know this at the time, is it gave me a really beautiful blank slate. So I was able to start really fresh and kind of with a new, fresh perspective. I didn't know that at the time, but it helped a lot. You know what I mean? That's fire, bro. Dave, yeah, so he was calling trying to open up a Dave Chappelle. He didn't even know. So you didn't <laughs> yeah. even know who he was. I didn't really know who he was. And then when I, when I saw at the club, I was like, oh, bro, it's the guy from You've Got Mail. <laughs> right, not half-baked. <laughs> oh, the treadmill guy from You've Got Mail. You know, Tom Hanks, you know? you got to talk to her and he's like what and like i was like oh it's the treadmill guy oh cool you know what i mean i didn't i didn't know and it's i remember crazy I how that's a memorable like, scene that's a very memorable scene for whatever reason because that scene stands out him on the treadmill with tom hanks tom hanks yeah so okay so you had that blank slate so then once you google how to be a comedian yeah. then what comedians did you say okay let who who did you resonate with or like who what comedians did you start like researching to be like okay I like what this comedian is doing versus I don't really like what this comedian is doing yeah man so I just I just went down the entire rabbit hole so this was early YouTube days remember like so you would just see a, a, a viral clip of stand-up so I would see people like uh, Patrice O'Neill Greg Giraldo I started seeing you know like John Stewart clips Stephen Colbert clips so those two things, I saw all these like beasts in the clubs really start to blow up, whether it was Patrice, Geraldo, Bill Bird, like they really started taking off. And then I saw these guys, you know, I was in college at the time. And you know, when you're in college, everybody's starting to establish their political views. 
And that's when I saw Colbert Report and I saw, you know, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. But I was so blown away by The Colbert Report. This was the first time I saw someone, like, double down on a character. Right. He's playing, the, he, like, Stephen was fully committed to this conservative news pundit character. And I, I just would watch just as a thought experiment of, like, yo, how is he going to take the conservative position on this? Like, there was just a school shooting. How is he going to, like, take a conservative position? You know, it was really interesting to see. Um, and that all just shaped me while I was in undergrad. Um, and, and, and then, you know, ironically enough, what ended up happening was, um, you know, I started to research it more and, and, and other YouTubers started blowing up. I don't know if you remember, there was a thing called Derek Comedy with like, yep. Don Lover and his crew. And I said, oh man, people are shooting sketches. And so that, that four years in college was just like a real good, almost like comedy undergrad for me in a way where I was just, you know, taking my early classes about what, what that was. Um, and then I started to try to just, Hey, if I do this, I need to learn how to shoot. I need to learn how to edit. I should take acting classes. And I started doing that my junior and senior year, but that was a, a massively profound time of my life, bro. Wow. And yeah. so, I mean, what about you? You were always, I felt like you were always like a theater kid, right? Yeah. I went to a performing arts high school. Um, so that was kind of my, I already had like the training background when it came to acting. And then when I came up here to, I'm in Atlanta right now. Yeah. Um, but when I, I went to college here also. And yeah. while I was doing college, I was able to book two, you, two. You went, to, you went to Clark University, right? Yeah, Clark Atlanta. Uh-huh. And I, I landed two movie roles while I was here, right. linked up with MTV. MTV um, made me a video jockey for their college uh, network, MTVU, because they saw me hosting my campus radio station. Um, when, you so were I, college, when you landed that stuff, were you like, bro, I'm hot? Like, I did. I was like, I'm the hottest nigga out here, and I need everybody to kiss my ass. That that's it. Fuck it with me. Um, nah, I, I wasn't like that, man. I, I'm the most, but everyone else saw it that way. It's like what you said earlier about the whole celebrity thing. So yeah, I'm the kid on campus that was in Stomp the Yard. You know what I'm saying? I'm the kid on campus that they're literally seeing footage of me in Cancun interviewing Young Jeezy in Akon. You know, and they're like, how the fuck did you? Are you accomplishing all of this? And you 2021. 20, you know, we just trying to pass our, our, our classes, you know, our exam. So it, it, it was it was crazy. But I always tell people this now, though. I've, I've always been the popular kid in school. Wow. I can see that. Like you, you just you, like the charisma, the charm, you're, you're cracking jokes, you're getting along with everybody. Right. However, in Hollywood, Hollywood has always made me feel like the least successful. Like, uh, so I've always been popular until I got to Hollywood. And th that's when I start to experience like, oh, this is how like the other kids at school used to feel like not being the go-to guy, like not being Mr. Charismatic or whatever the case is, you know? Uh, and so that was like, that was a humbling thing for me. Like, okay. And that also taps into why I work so hard also, but getting to LA, I didn't have any credit. So that I was on YouTube super early. Cause when I got on YouTube, all I saw was Donald Glover, like black, black people. I only saw Donald Glover and Atheon Crockett. Um, and then I put out some videos. Some of those went viral. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it is, it is what it is, but I know you was doing that too. So you started putting your videos out in college or when you got to LA. Yo, uh, I met, I met a close friend in, co in college and we would do these things, you know, every year at t did this thing called campus movie fest. I mean, this is like really I'm in the weeds, but they they went to campuses and like- the I best, did it. <laughs> yeah, the, the best short film on campus would get an iPod touch. I know, bro, this is dating me. Like everyone's listening like, yo, an iPod touch. <laughs> I'm telling you, like that was like a big deal. And we ended up, we ended up move, winning um, Campus Movie Fest uh, my junior year of college. And I just remember thinking like, oh bro, like, you know, I was, I was the president of our, we didn't have a comedy club. So I started a, a comedy club. Um, we were called Gridiron Gang. It was three of us and they gave us funds. I could, I could book acts to come perform at the school. So like people, you know, I would, we were in Davis. I would call, you know, some of the local comedians in San Francisco. Hey, will you come perform at UC Davis? So Ali Wong came down. This was before she really blew up. W. Kamau Bell, he came down. They were all in San Francisco at the time. And so I became that kid on campus who was like performing in the coffee house and then hosting the shows, you know, like hosting the big headlining acts. And um, then when we won Campus Movie Fest, I was like, man, this is, this is kind of a, a big deal. And started to, with a buddy of mine, put some videos out on YouTube. 
And then when I, when I got to LA and things weren't really clicking, then I, I met up with Fahim and Aristotle and Asif and we, we put together this thing called Goatface and we started doing sketches together. And then we eventually got a Comedy Central um, special out of it. But yeah, that was my first entryway and, and, and kind of like independently making my own little films, shorts. I mean, real talk, that's how I got The Daily Show. I shot my own field piece. I shot my own like audition with the green screen. I, I kind of created my own little reel if I was a correspondent on the show. So that all went back to college, just kind of having that industrious nature to be like, all right, I have this little goal and I'm going to shoot it and I'm going to do put my put my heart and soul into it and see what happens, you know? Yeah, man. And it, it paid off big, man. I still remember, that's actually something I'm, I'm about to get in the process of doing a shooting or something um, because some people are interested about something, but I got to, I got to do the work, you know? And that's something I admired about you so much. Number one, I remember the day you told me you got the Daily Show. Wow. I still remember it because, man, I was like, I, I don't know if you, sometimes it could take an outside person to kind of see something in you or whatever. And I always knew that was going to be your trajectory. Wow. Jack, yeah. I remember you telling me that you're like, bro, you could host a show. You could do this. I was it, like, yeah. it, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You and Tiffany Haddish, I called y'all correctly. I, I will always take pride in knowing you and Tiffany Haddish. I knew when I saw y'all in y'all element, what y'all path was going to be. Um, at least up to this point. I knew Tiffany was going to pop in movies. I knew you was going to be a phenomenal host and, and kill it in that, that field. But I remember we was at Marty's. We was outside on the steps. Yeah. And you told Marty's is a, a, a open mic spot that was popping in LA at one time. A lot of comedians used to go there and work out their material. Yeah. And you told me like, yo, I just got the daily show. And I was like, it made so much sense to me. I'm like, I knew it. Fucking knew it. I was like, they need you. I remember saying, I don't know if you remember that, but I was like, they need you. I was like, they need your perspective. They need somebody from your cultural background to speak on this platform and deliver that type of commentary. I was like, they fucking need you, yo. And from that to what you went on to after that, I mean, man, but that moment really stands out because in my mind, I was like, Hassan's about to be out of here. I'm like, that's all he needed. All he needed was a daily show for people to see how great he is and what he's about to accomplish. That means a lot. Thank you, bro. I remember that day and I just, <clears throat> you know, it's one of those things, man. Like, again, you, you don't see it that way. You just, you get off the phone with like your agent or your manager, my manager at the time. And they're just like, so comedy central gave you a three month contract. You know what I mean? So I'm on a rookie contract. That's all you're thinking about. And you know, I'm thinking about, all right, how am I going to, how am I going to get Bina out to New York? We had just got married. Like, all right, so I got this three month contract. Yo, is John going to keep me? He's going is he going to fire me? You, you have all those things. Am I going to be able to make it in New York? Those are all the thoughts that were, that were like swirling through my head. But yeah, man, you, you did call it. You were, I remember you saying that to me. It's just, it's just wild. Yeah, man. <sighs> have, you always, have you always had that confidence? Have you always just been like, I know it's going to be like this. I just know it. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really? Because, because I'm going to tell you when I don't, though. Wait a minute. And, th and, and this one I'm going to speak on behalf of the importance of having a, a, a great woman in your corner. Right. There's nothing like a woman that will uplift you when you're in your darkest times. Um, my wife has been there. There's definitely been days when something don't go right, I'm on the cusp of something major and everything just tumbled, rush hour. You know, here you are, here I am, the, the lead of a network show, and then certain things not adding up. This is supposed to be the biggest show of the season on network TV. It go from being a fall premiere to a mid-season premiere. It goes from having, supposed to have this big, uh, rollout to having this very small rollout when it comes to press and you start seeing things and you're like wait wait a minute and then it gets canceled during the commercial break you know <laughs> you know and so you here here you are like you like finally i'm about to be at the fuck see in my mind i'm like oh i'm about to be out of here i'm like i do rush hour for five seasons it's a wrap i'm like yo after that it's on to movies i'm straight and then the shit get canceled and then you like, God damn. And then that's when the confidence leaves. Because then you start thinking like, damn, am I as good as I think I am? Like, what, what is it about me that didn't work? What was it about the show that maybe didn't work? And you start questioning, you know? And then you start looking at time. You start looking at the, the clock is ticking. When I book Rush Hour, I'm 29. I'm like, I'm right on schedule. I know all the greatest comedians pop at 30. 
So when I'm book, when I book rush hour at 29, I'm saying, I'm, I'm right on fucking schedule. This is how this shit is working. Supposed to go this way. And then the shit get canceled. You're like, oh shit. So that be, I said all of that to say, then I have my wife. So when I don't have that confidence, she's the one that says, Justin, you got this. You go, you, 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 you as great as you think you are. You got to just keep going, continue to be strong. And you're going to get to the other side. You know, you go get to all the things you want to accomplish. But as a child and kid, yeah, I mean, I was always like, yo, I'm going to do this shit. I'm like, I'm moving to L.A. after I graduate. I'm going to fucking get on TV. <laughs> yo, I won most humorous in, in elementary and high school. I won most likely to be in a movie uh, in middle school. Oh, all right. So you were, all, you were always the funniest kid, like, flat out. Yeah. And you were, you were doing impressions. You were doing everything, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that makes sense. Bro. Yeah. It, was, it was just in you, bro. You're just like, it's in me. Like, but see, that's also the struggle in me because, and I'm a, I want to know if you ever felt this way before the Daily Show in Patriot Act. Right, right. When you, when you see everyone else, quote unquote, winning or working, and the, the only thing that stands out to me is the Kanye verse is, <laughs> damn, are these niggas that much better than me? Right, right. Have you ever experienced that? Man, I mean, so there, there were multiple like little phases of my career pre 2014 pre daily show. Um, and I'll tell you kind of the light bulb moment that I had that I had then um, pre daily show I was part of what I call just like the, the Hollywood grind machine like get him get in my dented Toyota Camry go to go to Marty's pay my five bucks to do my material. Right, like I would see like you, Paul, Aaliyah, like you know what I'm saying. Go, go drive all the way across LA to go to Santa Monica to be in a Pizza Hut commercial or some shit, you know, and and then you know go go up to Burbank and go to, uh, you know audition for the Untitled Adam Sezikio pilot. This is like this is your life. You're just like this like atom colliding randomly in in the universe, and you're hoping something will connect and combust, right? And um once I got to the daily show and I was a part of like that kind of, um, you know, political, you know, very prestigious program. I just saw the way John, Steven, John Oliver, some of the SNL guys, I saw the way they moved and I realized, yo, they're not just spending their days randomly trying to ask for work. They're spending their days imprinting their worldview on the world. So like, you know, you know, John and Steven did that big special in, in Washington, D.C., like where it was like John versus Steven. They did that. Like, I got to see like SNL guys, they, they would leave and then go write a movie and then produce it and go run and do that. They, they were spending their days not auditioning. They were just like, you know, pen to paper, writing out an entire project, producing that project and bringing it to market. And I was like, yeah, that's what my life has to be. Like, I can't waste my time anymore trying to fit in on you know, a fourth tier pilot where all the A-list stars have passed on it and now they're going to go ethnic with it. So they could cast it me or Justin or, you know what I'm saying? Any, Roy Wood Jr., any one of our friends. That's not the project that's going to make you. I realized I was like, oh, John is one of the greatest of all time at this because this suit is specifically tailored to him. Mm. You know, so-and-so, you know, Kate McKinnon is a beast on this show because her sketches are specifically tailored to her. So I had to really start thinking about, all right, what are the things that I'm doing that are one of one? Only I can do them. Like, if any, you try to cast anybody else, yo, this thing doesn't quite work. It just would not come off right. And um, that's what I've spent the last seven years of my like, career doing, whether it was Homecoming King, whether it was Patriot Act. Those things I'm really proud of because it's just like I put everything of me into it. It's just me. It's so awesome, you know? And... That, that's my thing. The, the doubt comes in when um, I get opportunities to do new or different things and I'm stretching myself a little bit. Like I'm on the show this season called The Morning Show, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm on screen with Reese Witherspoon and Jen Aniston and that checks me every day because I'm just like, yo, can I, can I hang with these guys? You know? Um, Which you can. Yeah, but so what, what, gave you, what gives you that confidence? What gives you that confidence when you're on set where you're like, bro, I'm, I'm going to do great. I'm going to hit my mark. I'm going to do great here. Even when you're not, writing the, you're not writing the lines, it's not like, you know what I'm saying? It's not just, right. you didn't write the lines, the punchlines, or the tags. You're just like. Preparation. I mean, I'm doing the diversity showcase with you. You have, this is just props to you. 
you and Tiffany have this innate thing, and John would talk about this with Steve Carell, you can elevate material. So I can give you this line and it can be, you know, average. And I could be like, give it to Tiffany or give it to Justin. They'll take a six out of 10 and take it to an eight out of 10. If I gave you nine out of 10, if I gave you Aaron Sorkin material, I know Justin's going to make that a fucking 12 out of 10. Your ability to elevate material. So there's times where I've been, the doubt comes in where I'm like, yo, this writing is a six out of 10 and I'm only give maximum, maximum taking it to a seven out of 10. That's where the, like the was, was, uh, the whisper of doubt comes over me. And you feel you only can take it to a, six, a seven out of 10 because of your talent level when it comes to acting? Or are you, are you saying the writing is so poor that it can only uh, <laughs> because... no. it, could, it could be a little, a little bit of both. You know, one of the interesting things is I've spent, all, you know, seven, eight years of my life, you know, writing, producing, and being on things that I've completely written now. Now I'm in this new part of my career where I'm, I'm doing ensemble pieces where it's not my writing, I'm part of somebody else's greater vision. And that's very, um, bro, it's, it's very, it makes me very vulnerable. I'm just like, damn, okay, I'm putting it all on your vision. All right. Why, why are you doing that? Um, for Other me, than your agent. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, know, you know, for me, man, it's like, uh, um, you know, it took me 10 years, one month, and nine days to get The Daily Show. I had been doing stand from Dave Chappelle to there. That, that was 10 years, one month, and nine days. Then when I, when I got to Hollywood in 2009, that was like four or five years of just like Marty's and Bruco and nobody fucking with you. So when, when you're in the zone, when you have that window of opportunity, you do have to take advantage of it. And so what I wanted to ask myself is like, yo, if I do have this opportunity, I do want to do projects where it's going to force me to put 45 pounds on each side of the bench press. Like it's, it's going to force me to up my weight. Um, and I, and I want to see what it's like to, to fly at that altitude. You know what I mean? Like Apple is spending the most amount of money on that show. I want to see if I can fly at that altitude with those actors and actresses. Like, yo, Billy Crudup is a beast. Reese Witherspoon is a beast. These people are beasts, you know? And I want to, I want to run with them. So that's what it's about. It's, it's that, it's that fight. Like, yo, I want to see if this, this is in me. Is this in me? You know what I'm saying? No, nah, for sure. I, I, I was going to tell you, because I don't know if... Clout, clout hype aside, like, this that challenge. Yo, is this in me? You know? Yeah, man. Well, you've definitely proven, uh, of course, when it comes to hosting that, you know, you that dude, for sure. I mean, there's... And, and I, I, got a, I got a few questions to ask you, because, you know, I, I don't get to talk to you often, man. And, but... <laughs> but one is to answer your question, what gives me that confidence? Even when I did Rush Hour, people was asking me, like, are you nervous stepping into Chris Tucker's shoes? Yes. My answer was always no, because I know I put in the work and preparation for me to land this. Like, every comedian, every black comedian, actor, and musician auditioned for this role. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, they didn't get it. Yeah. And but it was only because I put in one naturally where I'm, I'm in, in that vein. I'm from the school of Chris Tucker, Martin Lawrence right. type vein, Eddie Murphy, you know, I'm from that vein anyways. However, though, I knew I put in the work for me to be ready for that. So I say that even for you, you know, you can elevate it. You can elevate anything because even when I elevate material, it's partly performance, but yeah, I throw in my own, tags i throw in some improv so on macgyver i did macgyver for five years it just ended but even in that show it was throwing in my own ad libs throwing in the tag throwing in different physical things or different looks you right. know so right. you somebody even a look you know you could give a look a look or something or a certain mo you know whatever and yeah. that could elevate something there you go. I got um, you. yeah man and you and and, and what's great is man um, the thing I'm really excited about is the more time you have um, on set like that, you just get more confidence. You know what it is. You know what I'm saying? Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. for sure, man. What was the morning show an offer? The morning show was an audition. So that was really cool too, man. Like, you know, I knew I was in, I knew I was in the running and look like there's certain roles where, you know, you're in the strike zone, bro. I've spent seven years being a fake news anchor. You want me to go, <laughs> you want me to go be a fake news anchor? Right, straight up, <laughs> straight up. <laughs> and, and by the way, shout out to Chris Rock. I told Chris Rock about it when I got it because he was doing Fargo. I was like, bro, this is a, this is my first time doing a, a drama. Like it's 
you know, and if anybody anybody's seen the show, it's drama, drama. Like this is like, it's like soap opera kind of, it's very dramatic, right? And Chris was like, uh, <laughs> Chris was like, bro, you're more of a news anchor than they are. Like they have to act. You don't have to act. You look like you could be a news anchor. So I was like, oh, that's such a good point. Like for all of them, they gotta be like, okay, I'm a movie, so I gotta, act. what would it be like if I was on a, uh, a, a news set? Where I was like, bro, that's been my life for like eight years. Like, yeah, I already know what that's like. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. already know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you is that. They got to pretend that. You yeah. know. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Great, uh, shout out to Chris Rob, man. Yeah. Um, and by the way, man, you know what's so beautiful about Chris? I, people don't say this enough. Like, he still keeps in touch with what younger artists are doing. Bro, he know, like he's like, I saw Homecoming King. I'm like, bro, why would you have the time to see it? Think about somebody at his level too. Like you think about his last special, he had Bo Burnham direct it. Think about that, bro. He's 25 years older than this kid. This kid's like at the time, maybe 28, 29. For, for a legend who's on the Mount Rushmore of comedy to humble himself and be like, no, you can bring something new out of me. I, I hope I'm still that curious um, that humble and that passionate when I'm that age. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you will be, and that's what it is. I think he's wise enough to know that if you want to stay relevant to listen to what young people have to say, you find the smartest, youngest person you could find yeah. and, and see what they think. Um, that's another, I keep bringing up Kanye, but that's something that Kanye said also, you yeah. know. And but he, I, I, And by the way, Kanye's phenomenal about, about that too, like, he was having Travis Scott, all these guys around him years before Travis was like the biggest rapper in the world. Just Kid Cudi, had Kid Cudi around. Yeah, that influence, yeah. Yeah, nah, he, uh, I had dinner with him one time. I'm sure Chris will never remember this. But, <laughs> but after we had dinner, man, and I, I, I got to get to you, you, what you about to do with your next tour. But because you're performing at the venue I saw Chris at last, which wow. blew my mind, you know. And I, I know you in the thick of it. Yeah. But... That should, and if it doesn't blow your mind, I get it. But outside looking in, I'm like, when I, I looked at your tour dates yesterday, and I'm like, he's performing at the Strauss Center in Tampa. Like, I saw Chris Rock there three years ago when he was doing his Total Blackout tour. Like, that's a huge fucking venue oh, to, wow. be, to be doing. And I'm like, Hassan, it lets you know that it's possible. It lets you know if you put in the work and you're talented and you're a good person, you could get that. You know what I'm saying? Um, but while I, while I was having uh, dinner, because we went out to dinner with him afterwards, after the show. Yeah. And at the end of the dinner, I told Chris, I said, hey, man, I just want to thank you for allowing me and my wife to, you know, come here and, and, and have dinner with you. And he was like, come on, man. He's like, man, Eddie used to let me stick around, you know. <laughs> but he was just referring to, like, you a young comic. Eddie, used, Eddie Murphy used to let me tag along. So, yeah, man, you know, I'm going to show love to you. And I thought that, that, that spoke volumes, you know, of, of his character and humility and, and how good of a person he is. Um, I want to talk about Homecoming King yeah. and Patriot. And not Patriot. I want to talk about Homecoming King and the, the King's Jester, the, your new. Yeah. And when did they decide Netflix, or did you shoot it first? I don't know what happened. Sure. How did you get the special? Like, what, what moments led up to you getting that? Yeah, bro. So, so I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something. So, um, and this, this, this could be, this is a great conversation. And, and I'm so glad, like, because we know each other for years, I could, I could have it with you. You know, um, you ever feel this as an artist? Like, there's stuff that you're doing, like you're shooting MacGyver, right? And every day, you, you know, you got to shoot it in Atlanta, right? So you're right. Like, living in Atlanta, you got your apartment. You're going through the rigmarole, right? Like, oh, here, Justin, here's your coffee. Here's your blah, blah, blah. You go to your breakfast spot. You're in, you're in kind of the, the doldrums of your day-to-day -day life, right? But then there's, there's just this notebook that you have on the side, and it's just filled with all these ideas, whether it was rap, whether, whatever it is. It's poetry, a script. It's this thing that's pouring out of you, right? And so I remember, you know, I'm getting up. This is in 2010, 2011. I'm still in L.A. I'm getting up at the improv. I'm getting up at the haha. -ha, I'm getting up you know, at Marty's Laugh Factory. I'm auditioning for Montreal. And I, and I keep seeing, I'm like, you know, there's these pure stand-ups, like just the pure raw, like they go from joke to joke to joke, seven minute set. 
and they're crushing. And I'm all right. I'm cool. Like, I'm, it's not that I'm bad. It's not that I'm bombing. But there's a difference, bro, between like a Ferrari and a 3 Series. You know what I'm saying? Just that, that engine runs different. You know, and the 3 Series is nice and it's, it's, it's cool, whatever, right? But, but, but my engine couldn't rev like that. Like, I couldn't crush as like the way some of these guys and my contemporaries were. Or doing, they were doing new innovative things in the stand-up space that way. So I started doing these like storytelling shows, which like a lot of comedians weren't hanging out at, but people like Mike Birbiglia, Colin Quinn, they had pivoted. I started hearing them on NPR. They, they were doing these like longer like stories, right? And I started going to the Moth Story Slam and these other places. And bro, then I was crushing. Like I was crushing in a way nobody else was crushing because the, st- the, pure, the pure storytellers on, in theater, they're just telling these like long sob stories, but they're not tagging it. They're not having asides. You know, they're not building the roller coaster. You know what I'm saying? So I remember in 2011, 2012, I started telling the early stories from Homecoming King, which become Homecoming King. And I had this killer story about my prom experience. Anyways, that was an important moment for me where a lot of my friends that were around me were telling me, they're like, bro, you have a gift for this. And, and um, you know, shout out to Steve Harvey. Steve said this, like, you know, when people... <laughs> People say, follow your passions. They're actually wrong. You should follow your gift. Mm. I think my whole journey in life is figuring out what are my gifts? What are the things that God gave me? So I'm passionate about basketball, bro. But if you've seen me in the celebrity game, I'm not very good. I'm very passionate though. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm super, like, I'm, I'm very passionate. When, when you talk about celebrityness, yeah. that's when I knew you crossed over. Oh, the celebrity. When, yeah. I saw the, when I saw you in the NBA All-Star Celebrity, I said, this motherfucker's out of here. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I'm passionate about basketball, bro, but that, that ain't it. I'm passionate about a lot of different music, hip hop. Yeah, great, bro, but you should not be doing that. Right. Gifted, your gift, you know, and Steve was describing this, was something that you naturally do that you don't really have to try that hard at. And that second part of that sentence was everything. I'm like, we all have that thing. We all have that friend that was really good at calculus, didn't even study for the test. We all have that friend that was like, yo, she can sing. Bro, she's hung over from the night before and she can st- st- still sing better than any of you girls. We all have that friend that's like, yo, he can eat a whole large pizza the day before. He lifts up his shirt. He's got an eight pack. His metabolism is his gift. He's not even trying, right? Now, if you put work on top of that gift, you're out of this world. You're like, yeah. you're, you're actually one of one. You're Adele. You're a superstar. You're LeBron. Ari- yeah, you're LeBron. You're just a- Bro, I've seen LeBron. His shoulders are like here. Mav's shoulders are here. You know what I'm saying? He's already, he's already built like a tank. That's from God. Right. Now he put work on top of that. That's already his gift. Now he's, at, he's one of one, right? Right up. And so I was thinking about this. I was like, bro, I'm smoking people at these storytelling shows. The separation between number one and two is vast. What if I really doubled and tripled down? So I took the show when I, when I finally got to New York, I was like, I'm going to take the show off Broadway. Everybody on Broadway. Wait a minute. Is this, wait a minute. Is this during the daily show? You're doing this. Okay. So this is my thing. I'm just like, again, once again, you know, I'm on the daily show and I'm starting to figure out what's my gift. Like, and I realized I'm part of an ensemble cast. There's five correspondents. You know, I'm going to be on the show a few times, uh, maybe a couple times a week, maybe several times a month. Right. Uh, When John needs me to come in and hit something out of the park. Right. I'm going to go shoot field pieces, but with all this extra time, I want to build myself in New York. And so I started going to the cellar and then I started building up this off Broadway show at Cherry Lane theater. Um, You know, comedy central had passed on my, you know, I wanted to do a half hour. They had passed everybody had kind of passed. So I I took some money and and again, I got to give a shout out to my wife because when you're married, that's, that's your joint bank account. And we took $27,000 out of that bank account and we put up the first, uh, you know, kind of rent production payment for the theater. And then we took out another twenty twenty four twenty five thousand dollars to shoot like a mini special. And bro, that was like, that was all the money we, you know, you know how much Comedy Central these places pay. Like it was that plus some of my extra savings. Um, and we shot this like mini proof of concept and I put it up on Vimeo and then I shopped it around as it, in real time, as the show was selling out, in New York. So I could, I could feel a buzz building. And then I was like, as soon as the buzz, buzz builds, be ready, shop this around, you know, and shout out to Kristen Zollner at Netflix. I ended up showing her the proof of concept of act two of the show. And 
she bought it. She was like, yeah, I really like this. Wow. And, yeah, bro. And so that was like the second time in my like life where again, just I built the whole ship and then, you know, they believed and, and, and in the proof of concept I showed, um, I did like 3D rendering so I could show how like if I was standing on stage, the graphics would come in front of me, behind me, like you see that in Homecoming King. So Zollner could see like, oh, I see the direction. I see the vision of what he's trying to do, but she could press play on it, you know? And so that was the, that was the power of, you know, someone believing you internally, in, in you internally and showing them, not telling them, showing them what it could be. Um, and then third, just having like a supportive wife, bro. Like that wouldn't have been possible without her. Um, and so that was it, that it ended up getting sold. And then I knew, okay, if I get this shot, I get a Netflix special. I, I know the reach these things have. All right, I'm gonna swing for the fences. Like I'm gonna you know, work with the best lighting designers, the best stage designers. And it's funny, there were some other comics that were like, bro, comedy specials aren't supposed to look like this. It's not supposed to be you in front of like CNN screens. And it was that same thing. I'm like, I know, but I'm not you. Like, I'm not Justin. I'm not Tiffany. Like, I don't have what they have. I have this other thing that's in me. So I want to show the world that thing, you know? And, and it man, really you should, it was it really, it really, Yeah, it really clicked. That was that was probably my favorite special that year. I, I don't remember what other specials came out that year, but I remember seeing that thinking, this is a classic. It's a classic. You created a classic, which is so hard. Yeah. for a comedian to do even if it's a one-man show even like i don't know like john leguizamo has created a classic where freak Whoopi yeah. goldberg created a classic like there's a very uh, few caliber of like talent comedians that created like a one-man show classic but you you did that man man when you did these off-broadway shows because this is something that i always thought was very impressive by you how many people was coming out to these shows originally? Because you always, for me, outside, again, this is outside looking in, it's like, I felt like you skipped the club shows. Like most comedians, if you don't know, you do open mics, you start featuring for somebody, you start headlining, now you're headlining clubs, and then when you get big enough, you go to the theaters, like the bigger, <laughs> and then you fucking hit the arenas. But I don't remember you headlining clubs. Yeah, it, it, it was one of those things where, uh the the clubs that I was getting offers at like were like the C clubs like you know like way off the beaten path in Spokane Washington and I had done a couple of them and I remember thinking to myself I was like you know no disrespect but I saw the audience I saw the people that were coming out I saw that they had just papered a lot of the room and I was like bro I could I could spend a decade of my life here there's no way I'm gonna build a real substantial fan base this way the you know shout out to the other comics that can there's other comics that really built it that way but it know? takes years for them to build it that way like 20 years for them yeah. to build it like that yeah but it i'm like this isn't going to work for me for my skill set so i what i did and it's funny that you say that like maybe the perception from the outside was like bro like my man got a show going off broadway this is crazy but i was just dealing with in my head bro you're 30 grand in debt you got to make sure that you recoup so it, it started with, you know, just a hundred people showing up and then, you know, it, it was an off-Broadway theater. So it was like maybe capacity 300, 350 maybe. So like a hundred people show up, the back 200 aren't there, but you really resonate. They start telling their friends, their cousins, their mom, you know, and the culture didn't have something like that. Nobody had told the story of New Brown America like that, at, you know, from that perspective. And it went from a hundred, 125, 200, and then we started selling them out. You know? How quickly was that jump? That jump, it took about, that, that was about a month. So the first week was a little a paper. The second week, it got bigger. The third week, it got a little bit bigger. And fourth week, it got a little bit bigger. And I realized the power of, you know, storytelling. That, that to me was the X factor. Like, if you can tell a great story that's very personal and meaningful and they feel a connection to you, everybody's got a friend, a cousin, a sister, a brother that's like, Yo, instead of going to the movies, you gotta you gotta go to the show. It's just it'll move you in a way that like you did you know you you haven't seen before, and that was a a big life lesson for me where I was like, yo, jokes are cool, but jokes will take you to here. If you can tell jokes in a story, you're gonna be at the next level. And I realized I didn't know this. Nobody told me this. All the greatest stand-up comics that really pop are storytellers. Look at the biggest arena comics right now, or right now and from the past. You have Cosby. You have Pryor, you have Chappelle, you have Sebastian Maniscalco, you have all these guys that are, you know, 
Kevin Hart. They're all telling stories. Sebastian tells stories. Kevin Hart tells stories. Joe Coy tells stories, right? They're all storytellers. And I didn't know that. And then it clicked for me in that moment where I'm like, you tell a great compelling story with jokes in it. You you really established a vulnerable connection with people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Whew, man. I mean, th- th- these are these are facts. Patriot Act, because I thought that was something yeah. that you did um, that I didn't know you did when I listened to your, your interview with Kevin Hart, which was the same thing that you're saying you did with Homecoming King, yeah. which is you paid for the pilot, right? Yeah. So I guess now I didn't know that about Homecoming King. So I guess you saw that work with Homecoming King. So now your thought is now I'm going to do the same thing with Patriot Act. Let me go and shoot it and yeah. show them what my vision is for this show. Let, let me put it this way, man. Like, it's, I think the one thing that I've been lucky enough, maybe that's been my gift, is I can recognize, I can recognize when you're in the strike zone. What I mean by that is this. Like, I'm just like, Say you're at the BMW dealership, you got a three series, right? But you know you're you're right, you're right underneath a five series, right? You're like, yo, I could upgrade right now to a five series. It's 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 within reach. A lot of people, they try to go from, you know, like I'm at Marty's, I wanna be, I wanna be number one on the call sheet in a universal studio film. So that 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 leap is too big. But you could go from Marty's to like Wild and Out. You can go from Wild and Out to then maybe like your own show on MTV or over and overall. And then you could maybe be in an ensemble. Like it's understanding what the next monkey bar is. So I knew when I was at the daily show, homecoming King had just uh, was about to come out and I had just done the white house correspondence dinner. So I was like, you know, no, no disrespect, but I know what reality is. I'm like, yo, you're, you're, you're going to be hot and talked about right now for like a month. You got like a month like right. where everybody's like, yo, you the guy. And then everybody's going to know like, yeah, you're funny, but you're not that funny. Like, that's what to me, like hype is like hype is, yo, this person's really good, but you're getting, you're getting more than what you really, really kind of deserve. Not trying to be like disrespectful about it. I knew that even about myself. So I knew, bro, you're going to get any meeting you want in town. Now you could go take those meetings. And I had a lot of friends that got bad pilots or they got bad shows because they had a vision in their head and they told it to the executives and they told it to the people. And by the time the whole thing gets built and you actually see what it was on Comedy Central, on MTV, you're like, bro, this looks like everything else. Mm-hmm. Once again, I knew I'm like, I know what my specific suit is. I know the type of show I can pull off. So I went to Bina again and I was like, I know we saved up this Comedy Central money. I know we saved up some of your money. Like, can we please? I feel like this is... I don't, I'll never be the new kid like this in 2017 again. Like the way it was in April, 2017, April 29, 2017, my life was different than the following day after I did the correspondence center shit was just different. So I said, please let me take these next four or five months while I have this heat. Let's go shoot. Let's go shoot this proof of concept. Um, and I did that with my, with my writing and producing partner, Prashant, we did it. And I, again, I went all in um, and it paid off. That being said, it was a calculated risk. I didn't just go all in and then decide to like uh, shoot like a a very niche, you know, indie drama. It wasn't that. I didn't hard pivot. It was it was like the next logical jump. You know what I'm saying? What do you feel? It, first, I, I got to tell you because I want to give you your flowers, man. Why are you here? You know what I'm saying? I know other people probably sang your praises, but this is coming from like a peer, and this is coming from I've seen the the journey uh, of you. This is when I knew you was great. It was two very like definitive moments that I saw you. One was the it was an MTV showcase uh, at the Laugh Factory, huh. and I don't know you was doing your set, and I, I don't know if the crowd was really fucking with you at first. That the crowd wasn't really on your side, and then you kind of felt like just went off script. Yeah, I was like, "What is this?" Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and you destroyed after you was just like you called out them for their bullshit the audience and i'm talking about you lit fire on the ass and i was like that was my first time like oh i was like hassan's a beast that's when i first saw it the right. second moment was you was doing you was touring homecoming king and you came to atlanta and i hit you up you gave me some tickets i remember that yeah and i came through in the last first of all i was impressed that it was sold out that's when I was like, well, when the fuck, when did this 
else happened? You know, because I'm like, he ain't been like performing at no improvs. So how did, that's why I asked you that question. I'm like, how did this even happen that he has this large of a fan base? Right, right. So you destroyed. I'm talking about thunderous laughter throughout. Then it was heartfelt. And I was like, yo, I was like, I was like, I was like, he's going to go down as one of the greats, you know? I, I and I and I mean that because when I saw that with my own two eyes, those two moments, I was like, "This is some other level shit. This is some stuff that people, uh, very few people, can get laughs that hard, and it not be hacky, and it be something personal, um, and something that really touch you. It's very few people that could that could do that, man. Um, so when you did that, I I, I thought that was I- incredible. When it comes to Brown, and when you say brown, because I don't know that this is a true ignorant question. I don't know. Yeah. Are you Indian? Did Indian, you want to say yeah. okay? Yeah. But uh-huh. you all just say brown. Yeah. And I mean, and, and like by that I mean also like, you know, like when we talk about race in America, we think about it's it's black and white, but there's also Latino Americans. There's also like Southeast Asians, right? There's South Asians like me, Indian, Pakistani, that, right? There's Filipino, Chinese, there's all these, this new mix of like immigrants in the, in, in the U S right. And, and that's what I mean by that. Like that, that, like what I mean, like collectively Brown, but by Brown, I mean, yeah, like Indian. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. I'm, I'm Negro, everybody in case you're wondering. <laughs> but, but. Oh, but you know, what's, what's funny, man. Like sometimes when I'm like, I'm in hair and makeup. Right. And like the, the makeup artist is black. I'm like, yo, we're Brown because like our, the Mac makeup you need on you is the same that you need on me. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's that same, like we're in the same, like uh, Mac makeup range. You know oh, for sure. For like, sure. It's, it's basically a group of people where it's, I call them like, turn the flash on, please. <laughs> <laughs> like people, like so white people don't know that you actually have to have flash for like me or you to show up in a photo at night. Oh yeah. The worst is like when you kicking it with a group of white people, they're like, we don't need flash. We got it. And you're like, no, motherfucker, we don't got it. You got it. You and your red eyes go show up. Uh, remember that was a thing. Like all white people had like red eyes and like old films. They fixed that. I think I don't see it anymore. Yeah. yeah. But I was like, what the fuck is what's going on with y'all? Um, <laughs> shout out to the white people. Um, Indian. I brought that up because Indian comedians, so I heard Russell Peters say on the podcast that you opened up for him. Like, yeah. I don't know when this was. What point of your career was this at when you opened up for, for Russell Peters? I was, I was still in Sacramento at the time. I was still in college. So I was, I, bro, and that was crazy. Shout out to Russell, like, for him to be so kind. He, he was just, he came to the sack punchline. And I begged, I begged, like, Molly the booker, like, yo, please let me open for him. Like, I have to. Like, he was the one. You know, he was, like, the biggest you know Indian comedian in the world and so um when I finally got to meet him you know how those things can go it can go left right or center it can go really bad especially when you know he was at that level he was doing arenas and theaters and um you know it could be one of those things where it's like yo don't come in the green room like right you know, open but you stay there right oh man like he got my parents tickets he was just so cool and I, and I told Kevin this on the podcast like he's like and next time you come to LA you can come out and stay with me and that was one of those things where it's just like just some I felt like a a kid in a Bronx tale you know like I'm going to go see Sonny he lets me hold his watch you know like I can ride around in a car with him I just got to see what could what you could do and that was really cool and so shout out to Russell for just being a real one you know yeah he he said did you hear his episode with Kevin (laughs) he was like it was like Hassan was like this nerdy kid he said I had no idea he was gonna grow into this handsome sex symbol (laughs) that (laughs) that because you are for sure the most handsome comedian in the history of no no one wears a suit better than you um it's it's, it's it's very impressive. Do you feel like is there ever a time do and I don't know if this is a, a conversation that Indian comedians have. Right. Do you all ever talk about doing something together like y'all version of Kings of Comedy or uh, that would be dope. Go ahead or or what? Or are you thinking more of the Kevin Hart route which is no nah, I don't need <laughs> I don't need y'all. I could do this shit. I'm already close to arenas so I could just do this show, this do this on my own. No, you know, so it's so funny. Like we did Go Face, which was which was a sketch show, and that was like all kind of like brown Middle East types, like 
vibes and sketches and themes. And that was really cool. So I love doing stuff for the culture. One of the things that I, I, I can't wait to do, um, and this has just been a real modern development, man, is like because of YouTube, the world, and you know, I, I got to be on The Daily Show with Trevor too. Trevor showed me, Trevor Noah, showed me how big the world is, you know, like he showed me, you know, amazing comedians that are from the UK. He showed me there's so many amazing comedians that are in South Africa. And so I started thinking about it that way. I was like, yo, I should, you know, now that the world is opening up, I should go to India and do shows with comics out there. I should bring some of them out here. You know, we're doing Radio City. I should have a couple of them pull. I should have Russell pull up. Like, just to do it, not, it's not a money thing. It's just to do it for the culture, just to do it. You're you're doing Radio City. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Do that blow your mind? Or or when you get, or or you think when you get there, you might be like, holy, holy shit, I'm doing Radio City. So, you know, like right now, I'm, I'm in just a, a, a janky ass Sheraton in Memphis. Like, bro, I mean, there, there's like stains <laughs> on the couch. I mean, I don't know what that stain is right there. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to be honest. I would think somebody at your level might be in suites at this point. No, I'm just like, uh, you know, I'm just booking whatever. And I'm just like, I, I got it. But to me, bro, it's this, man. I, I'm, this is what I'm knee deep in, right? You know what I'm saying? I'm just knee deep in the script. That's, that's all I'm sweating. You know, I'm just like it's got to be worthy of that. The last thing I want to do, bro, is just to be all frills, all, you know, I'm wearing a leather suit or whatever. And then it's, it's just a seat. Like everybody leaves the show and they're just like, it was all right. How are you, how are you feeling so far? Right. So, you know, here we are, I'm talking to you is June 12th tour starts September 17th. So I'm feeling good, but there's a big gap between good, you know, great and phenomenal. That's what I'm trying to traverse, you know. And when you did Homecoming King, you was on a, I'm on some phenomenal I was shit. like, we're somewhere between great and phenomenal. This show is great. Like, it is resonating with people. It's whatever. The phenomenal thing, that's out of your hands. I, th- that, to me, is divine destiny. Yeah. You have, to have, you have to strike some chord in their heart that makes them feel a certain way. I try not to think about that because you don't want to work backwards. Like, Oh, this is going to go viral. You don't want to operate from that. You want to come from a true place, you know, in your reps. The, the arena, hold on. I want to, how, how, how close do you think you are to doing arenas? Um, I mean, in New York, we could have, we could have done it in New York. We could have done Madison square garden. Yeah. Yeah. Man. For real. Yeah. I mean, like, so two radio cities is 14,000. Madison Square is like, you know, 17. So we're close. You know, it's, it's right there. You know. I see it, man. I see it. When I, when I saw Homecoming King, I was like, damn. But when I saw your new tour dates and I saw the venues you were doing, I'm like, honestly, I mean, if anything, one special away. You know, after this, this next one, I would think you, you got it, you yeah. know. But do you think, just honestly, do you think comedy is supposed to be in arenas? No, <laughs> because I'm, I'm going to be honest. I think Chappelle does it right. The, the level of the venues, the radio cities, yeah. you know, uh, when he's in uh, Atlanta at the Tabernacle. Yeah. I think if anything, that's probably as big as stand up probably yeah. should be. Yeah. 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 That's what I think. So I, I think arenas, those are cool. Those are a flex, but you know, again, like, I'm I'm getting older, bro. I'm 35, right? So I'm just about honoring the art form at this point. You know, you know, me, you know, dad to dad, husband to husband. I got two responsibilities. I gotta make sure the bag is correct for the family. You know what I mean? And family's really big for me. And just taking care of them is very important. And the second thing is, bro, I know like I'm I'm 30, I'm not gonna be Zach Saffron. Like I'm not the young, good looking Indian kid. I'm an older dude. I'm entering this new era where I want to do really great art from a wise, you know, position in POV. Like that's what I'm trying to make really good artistic choices. And so I think as a kid, I'd be like, bro, I've always wanted to do an arena, but there's part of me that's also like, are you honoring the art form or are you mm-hmm. just doing this for ego? Like that is a, it's, is, is this just a flex? Like if, if it's a flex, go flex. But, but are you going to give everybody in that stadium a really good show? I even think, you know, I've seen shows. I bought, I bought tickets to go see Chappelle and rock at radio city. And I sat kind of far in the back and I'm like, damn, you gotta, these are big rooms. You gotta give them a show. You gotta give people a show. Yeah. So this is it, man. Where, where do you want to see yourself like five, 10 years from now? Like what other things 
are are you are you going to accomplish or, or would like to accomplish? But I, I, I see I, I see you accomplishing everything you set out to do. Man, God willing, I just wanna um you know, it's it's funny, like um, you know, back in the Marty's days, it's so funny that you saw all these things in me. Bro, I can't tell you how many times I would I would be in that like Marty's parking lot, just straight up crying in that dented Camry. I can't tell you, bro. Like Wow. Yeah, man, because it was just like you're testing for this pilot, it don't doesn't go your way. And, you know, at that time, again, you know, just something to consider. You don't know what somebody else is going through. So I had gotten into law school and I had gotten into a good law school. I had gotten into like UCLA and USC. I'm on the wait list. You know, all I got to do is just petition to get in. I can get, I can get in. And I'm, you know, I'm going through it. I'm like, I, I can't book a pilot, you know, maybe, you know, once every, you know, eight, nine months, I book a commercial and that just gives me enough rent to get through the next thing. I'm on disaster date. Like, am I really going to throw a real career away to be on disaster date? What if that's all that's destined for me? Right. And so that time, you know, I was really struggling with, bro, I'm, they're not picking me. What if I never get picked? And I think the new chapter, what I hope to do with my career is I'm just doing projects where I'm like, I don't care if you, you don't have to pick me. This is happening whether you want it to or not. So I hope to, con to continue to write and produce film and television on my terms. I'll write it, I'll produce it, I'll put up the bag and we'll put it out. You know, I'm gonna do one man shows and theater tours on my terms. I'll write it, I'll produce it, I'll hire the lighting designer, the stage director, the director, all of that stuff. And, Cause I don't wanna live my life waiting to be picked anymore. So that's my mission and goal, just to produce and make, make my own vision of the world. Straight up, oh, okay. Late night talk show. Would you ever do a late night talk show? But I did pay you. You're talking about like a daily show? Yeah, I mean like I mean like the Tonight Show type thing. Oh. Or, or are you over? Talk, or are you over that? Are you over the hosting type you know, thing? You no, know, it's interesting. Like uh, <laughs> you know, something I was thinking about that'd be really fun, bro. I'd love to host Jeopardy just as a guest host. For like, <laughs> bro, like for like six because because. Cause I would love to bring like humor to it a little bit too. Like it's this like beautiful, like amazing American institution. And then I could bring this like youthful comedic energy to it in a good way. It's like nerd shit and comedy all in one. Like, I feel like that would, I could so do that. Um, you I know, told, they I, would do that if you asked them. I, I told Bina, I told Bina that and Bina's like, yo, do that when you're 50. I was like, bro, it'd be, but it'd be kind of fun <laughs> just for like six months. I don't know. You know? Now, oh, oh, okay, and I promise you this is the last one, because I pro this is it. No, nah, go ahead. SNL, why haven't you done it? What's the struggle? Oh, it'd be, it, I, that would be my dream. Like, it would be a dream to host SNL, and I would love, like, I would pour my heart into that monologue. I can't wait. The SNL monologue to me, that's everything. Like, the SNL monologue to me is everything. All right, well, at least you know I, I didn't hold you for no bullshit questions, but... <laughs> but <laughs> Because I, I watched SNL and I seen when Donald Glover did it and Issa Rae did it. I said, Hassan is in that same bag. Where, where is he? You know what it is? You just have to be anchoring a big project. So, you know, like when they, when they do the hosts, minus a few comedians, it's usually like Timothy Chalamet is the lead of this movie or so-and-so is in this movie and it just got nominated for an Oscar. So... You know, but I felt that I felt that for Patriot Act. I felt like that was yeah to me yeah you know but God willing like you know something will happen it'll be that right moment and I'll be ready so. for sure I'm out of here man I love you you a king like Thanks, I said bro. this is this is urban legends we do this to celebrate people I consider living legends and making legendary moves man I appreciate you and man just keep doing your thing bro. <laughs>